Well, good evening and welcome to the February 2nd, 2021 HSBB monthly meeting. May I have a roll call, please? Yes, uh, good evening, Mr. Chair and board members. Uh, Eric Rosenau? Here. Uh, Jade Nelson? Jade? Oh, present. Dan Kaiser? Here. Linda Dixon? Present. Catherine Huff? Here. Chair Burkett? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. <clears throat> May I have a report on the posting of the agenda, please? Uh, Mr. Chair, the agenda for this meeting was posted for public review at the City Hall Bulletin Board on the west side of the Council Chamber in accordance with established laws and procedures. Thank you. Um, I would like to propose a motion to amend the agenda, um, adding the HSPB interview questions under discussion items this evening. So I'd like to ask the board if they have any additional revisions. So I made a motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. Oh my gosh, we got seconds all over the place. So. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have a motion by myself and a second by Eric Rosenau. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 6-0. So let's move right on to public comments. This time it's been set aside for members of the public to address the Historic Site Preservation Board on agenda items and items of general interest within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Although the Historic Site Preservation Board values or comments pursuant to the Brown Act, it generally cannot take any action on items not listed on the posted agenda. There will be three minutes assigned for each speaker. Testimony for public hearings will be taken at the time of the hearing. And uh, staff, I believe we do uh, have re some requests to speak at public comments. Yes, um, Mr. Marshall, uh, who is here on the screen with us has requested to speak during public comment. And I also, uh, prior to this meeting, forwarded to all of you a written public comment that came in from um, Nikki McLaughlin of BS Modern Committee. Thank you. Would you invite the speakers to uh, come online with us, please? I believe Mr. Marshall is available. Rod, are you ready? Yes, I am. Go ahead, please. You have three minutes. Thank you, Ken. Uh, good evening, all. I'm Ron Marshall from the Palm Springs Preservation Foundation. On November 12, 2020, PSPF sent a letter to the Palm Springs city manager asking the city to consider revising the current preservation ordinance to correct what we consider to be two glaring problems. The first problem is who can submit nominations. And the second problem is the issue of owner support. Uh, the letter is fairly straightforward. So I'll not summarize it in the interest of time. On an optimistic note, after some very constructive email exchanges, with Ken Lyon today on this topic. I do believe that the planning staff can come up with a policy workaround that would be acceptable to all and would obviate the need for a rewrite of the ordinance. I understand you can't discuss this because it's not on the agenda, but I think it's an important uh, issue, uh, an important policy discussion. And I'd ask that you consider it for your March meeting agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ron, we really appreciate that input. And I think you make some very valid uh, points. So happy to see that we have uh, some solutions in, in process. Thank you. Mr. Lyon. And Mr. Chair, I'll give you a brief summary on that under staff member comments at the end of the meeting. Good, that would be excellent. Okay, we also have on the line, Ken, I believe another person. Do we have anyone else? Um, no one else has spoken to me wanting to speak. I see Gary Johns is here. Um, Gary, if you can, are you wanting to speak during public comment? Can you turn your microphone on? No, thank you. Just here to uh, hear the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no other speakers. Uh, Mr. Maruzzi, were you here to speak? If you could turn your microphone on. Um, no, I was just here to observe. Okay. Uh, one question though, I, I don't know if this can be answered. Will this item be um, presented to the Planning Commission? Uh, yes. Okay, that's another reason why I'm not gonna speak. 
<laughs> and then um, Janet Hansen is our, I think, uh, oh, is Janet Hansen, are you here to speak during public comment? If you could turn your microphone on, please. No, just to observe. Okay, thank you very much. No other speakers, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. So I will now close public comments and move to the consent calendar. Item 1A, approval of the minutes for December 1, 2020 HSPB meeting. <clears throat> Has everyone had a chance to review the, the minutes that were sent? Then uh, does anyone have changes to the minutes? We have a motion to accept the minutes as presented. Move to approve as presented. And do I have a second? Second. So I have a motion by Member Dixon and a second by Mr. Kaiser. <clears throat> Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? I will abstain, I was absent. Okay, so we have five, um, Mr. Lyon, um, that approved, and we have one that's uh, abstained. Thank you. Okay, the next item is public hearings, for which we have none this evening, and the next item after that's unfinished business, which there is none. However, we do have um, items under new business, item 4A. The Secondary Source Productions, LLC, DBA Reform of Palm Springs, requesting a certificate of appropriateness for alterations to the J.W. Robinson's department store building, a class one historic site located at 333 South Palm Canyon Drive. May I have a staff report, please? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. As noted in your staff report, this is an application that's an basically a tenant improvement. However, in this case, there are alterations to the exterior of the building, which the proposed tenant is requesting approval of the HSPB because this is a class one historic site. Uh, on page uh, three and four, uh, primarily on page four, are some of the details of the application. What's being proposed here on the exterior of the building is to activate some of the raised terrace area on the east facade of the building to enable outdoor dining. So what you're seeing in the materials that you have in your packet uh, and in the staff report is a uh, series of uh, a pair of uh, two uh, new double doors are proposed that would uh, allow access onto the dining terrace. And then the dining terrace would be established by creating uh, some enclosed railings around portions of the raised terrace on the east facade. So in your staff report <clears throat> on page um, three and four, I've given you some background so that you understand uh, some of the past recent uh, modifications on this building that have been approved by the HSPB. And uh, as noted there, um, the board approved in 2015 alterations to this building that would enable it to be adaptively reused for multi-tenants. It used to be, of course, a single department store. And so you see on page four at the top, there are the images and the elevations and the primary facades showing that work that was done in 2015. I bring that to your attention because some of the, one of the pairs of new doors that are being proposed will be going into that 2015 curtain wall or storefront area. Um, the other thing I wanna point out in the material that I have sent, sent to you, late this afternoon, you should have received um, a, uh, a diagram or a sketch and um, Flynn, I am gonna to try to share my screen here in case there's any um, uh, missed uh, options here where people have not um, uh, seen these, uh, these materials. So um, can you see this image? Yes. 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 Okay. So what you're looking at here, board members, are two schemes um, for an alternative um, design for the railings that are proposed to enclose these two outdoor terrace areas. As I noted in my correspondence to you uh, earlier today, the applicant and the materials that you received in your packets last week were proposing what are basically referred to as uh, stainless steel cable strung um, uh, railings, where the top rail and the vertical stanchions are solid steel and a series of stainless steel cables are stretched between them 
to provide the intermediate railings. In conversations with this applicant, we began looking at these railings and trying to figure out if there might be a more appropriate way of integrating railings with the building that are more respectful and related to the architecture of the building. And the applicant has come back with the schemes that you see on my screen. This topmost one is proposing a diamond pattern uh, that's uh, somewhat reflective of the diamond or bow tie, bow tie pattern that you see in the um, fascia of the building as well as in the concrete veneer faces on the um, walls. Um, in those diamond patterns that you see, those, uh, the diamond portion of it, the long horizontal diamond portions of it would be flat painted steel stock. I believe their color proposed here is black so that it would recede. The lower image down here is one in which the, um, the uh, intermediate uh, railings that comprise the filler, if you will, below the top rail would be more open, uh, almost as a tubular steel or a solid steel bar, uh, either square or round, that would create those um, rectangular um, forms. Uh, so the applicant is proposing um, either of these for your consideration. Um, I would suggest the uh, top one with the diamond pattern, um, in my opinion, uh, is a bit more appropriate, but I will leave those decisions uh, to the board. Um, let me stop sharing my screen there. So the analysis for you in considering alterations to a class one site uh, come out of the zoning uh, code or the municipal code chapter 110 of the preservation ordinance. And there are specific findings that you must make in order to approve a certificate of appropriateness. And those are listed beginning on page six and seven of your staff report. And the, the analysis that we have done is a conditional recommendation for approval, which I will get into in just a second. I wanna just also summarize from a CEQA perspective, uh, we have a situation here where this is obviously deemed a project under CEQA. And the guidelines suggest that uh, in order for the city to determine the project is categorically exempt not requiring further analysis under CEQA, that the proposed project does not materially impair the uh, defining characteristics of the building and that the uh, work is done in accordance with the Secretary of the Interior standards. Um, we have uh, determined in our analysis of this that the project does meet those uh, criteria. Uh, the, the proposed railings are sensitively integrated uh, if they were to be removed in the future, the, um, the raised uh, terrace area uh, concrete can be patched and the area restored to the way that it was previously. Number two, the doors. The doors go into uh, storefront areas, uh, most of which are newer. The one on the uh, annex building or to the southern portion of the building on the east facade is new storefront. Now that new storefront was designed to look like the original storefront. So it is in keeping with the um, aesthetic of the building. And in both of these cases, if a future tenant were to uh, um, not require these doors, those doors again could be removed and the storefront restored to its original condition. So we're prepared to take a categorical exemption under CEQA that the proposed project does not materially impair uh, the defining characteristics of the building. And those defining characteristics for your analysis are on page two of your staff report. Um, let me go back to the face, to the front cover. There's a few things here that um, I just wanna um, clarify for you. We got this application uh, rather late and I scrambled to get this uh, together for you today. Uh, and so I've, I've got a few details here that I'm recommending that a, a subcommittee be formed. And I've identified this on page one of your staff report to establish a subcommittee of the HSPB to review the furnishings, equipment, railings for the proposed outdoor dining terrace to assure compatibility with the modern aesthetic of the building. Uh, to prohibit the installation of misters, permanently mounted heaters, lights, shade structures, speakers, and other attachments to the exterior of the building. To require that the applicant provide more information about the interior special effect lighting on the dance floor and the ceiling lighting to avoid glare and light distractions on the outside of the building, especially through the clear story windows. And I believe, um, Rob will be explaining more about their um, plans for um, controlling light spillage on this building. Uh, number four, to require that any um, new roof mounted mechanical equipment be located within the screen roof enclosures that integrate with the architecture of the building. Uh, number five, 
to recommend a more minimal design for the ABC railings. We've already talked about that. This is a bit of an old staff report given these brand new materials that I just got earlier today that I forwarded to you. So, And then number six, to propose trailing rosemary or a similar type of plant material in lieu of the upright fence post cactus, which would be more appropriate uh, and softening for the area around those dining terraces. <clears throat> And then the last condition of approval is that uh, should the applicant uh, vacators, the tenant vacate the space, that the railings are to be removed and the concrete terrace carefully patched to return the terrace to its original historic appearance. And I would add a footnote to that, that it would, uh, that, that condition would apply to the railings and the doors that are also being proposed. Um, so that concludes um, my staff report. Again, we are recommending a certificate of appropriateness for this. I am available to answer any questions you may have. And um, Rob, the applicant is here with us and would like to speak briefly on it. And uh, George, his architect is here as well. Thank you. And I would uh, like to you. invite Sorry. the applicants to uh, speak with us. We look forward to it. Thank you. Uh, first off, thank you, Ken, for, um, for putting together the staff report. Uh, your assistance in this has been invaluable. Um, and I thank the board for consideration for this application. Um, you know, as Ken you know, points out, you know, you, our intent here is to be respectful of the building and its history. It's one of the reasons that we chose the building. Um, we do find that the historical nature of the building and the mid-century um, aesthetic that it has is going to be a draw for our business. Um, so we're, we want to maintain that as much as possible. Um, you know, even the railings that we're having discussions about, they're really only a requirement by the alcohol, Alcoholic Beverage Control Board in California. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't you know, even ask for those, but we do need to have them for that purpose. Um, I mean, both George and I are available to answer any questions that you have. Um, is it happy to you know, be here for consideration? Board, are there questions that we would like to ask? Yes, Mr. Nelson. Okay, so I have a few questions for the applicant and uh, questions to staff as well. So whether or not I do all that now or a little bit now, a little bit later, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to do it anyway. But for the applicant, um, if you could answer the following, uh, in the project section near the northernmost Palm Canyon side, uh, next to where a new entry exit door is proposed, the original diamond block facade extends from the indoor, excuse me, extends from the outdoor to the indoors. Um, that architect, excuse me, that architectural feature, uh, I believe, should remain visible and unobstructed. But uh, at the end of that wall, there's a little white bit that's about a foot wide and it doesn't have any diamond block uh, pattern on it. So I was wondering if uh, that was planning to be cut off or capped or how it would be finished. And do you understand the bit that I'm talking about? I was just at the site um, recently. You know, we've, the decision to include the patio on the North storefront was actually fairly new. Um, and that was somewhat based on conversations with Ken, where originally we were planning on just doing the patio on the south side, but because of you know, the fact that, the, that that would cause some issues for us, you know, we abandoned the idea of putting more patio on the south side. And then I reached out to um, the landlord to confirm that we actually had access to that north patio. So I was just recently at the space to look at where that diamond um, concrete wall comes into the space behind the glass wall. So I'm familiar with it from a recent review. Um, I agree that the diamond wall should remain interior to the space. Um, the, the small gray portion, um, to be honest with you, if it's, if we believe, if you as the board believe that that, you know, is more aesthetically pleasing to have it removed or capped off, we're happy to do that. Um, you know, or if I know that Hal said that he, and Hal being the landlord, said that he was, that he had um, acquired that diamond pattern concrete um, 
wall if we wanted to continue that pattern to finish it off. Um, I'm fine with that as well. I, there's nothing from our perspective that needs to go into that space. So we had no intention of you know, removing the wall. And, and like I said, if it needs to be capped off, that would be fine. I don't, George, do you want to, if there's a, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I mean, it's that little alcove there is, is kind of a dead space in the plan. Um, but, you know. George, can you speak up a little bit, please? Sure. That, that little alcove is, um, it's kind of a dead space in the plan, but um, you know, I'm, we're perfectly fine just leaving it as it is and letting that pattern just go through. Great, thank you. I just wanted to emphasize that that is a really important uh, inside outside architectural feature. And the fact that you can see it through the window, I think really speaks to the integrity of the building. So I think it's important that um, that pattern either, either be finished off on the end or um, uh, capped or, or something uh, that is sensitive that is approved by uh, the board and or staff. Um, so I have a couple more questions for the applicant if you're ready for them. <laughs> uh, the next one is, uh, do you plan for the front patio railing to align with the edge of the top deck or will they align with the scoring on the concrete, which appears about a foot in from the nosing of the deck? George, I'll have to defer to you on that one. Um, I know that there are some requirements how far the railing can be from the top. We had you know, some discussions around you know, gates and things that would have to open onto a, a stairway. So I don't know if there are requirements to speak to or if you have an opinion you know, from an aesthetic perspective. Yeah, um, we were showing it um, not all the way at the edge, but not as far as a foot in either. Um, and we've had some back and forth with Ken about how we're going to detail these railings, but if it ends up becoming a sleeve detail where we're coring a sleeve into the concrete. Um, that typically wants to be at least three or four inches from the edge of a con concrete anyway, or, or it's going to spall out the concrete. Um, so, you know, I, I was thinking somewhere more in the, in the center of that, um, it's almost like a flush tread condition that you're, you're that you're describing, and and so I would think kind of in the center of that. Um, so about six inches in is is where I think would make sense. Um, there are portions of this patio that um, feel a little bit narrow, so I I, I don't want to I don't want to push the railing in too far, um, and you know we're. Uh, we're also proposing adding this plant, this this railing onto the top of the existing planter that Ken just sort of um, zoomed us away from there, and and and, and in that condition, um, we'd like to be kind of centered in the top of of the um, of the planter edge. But again, that's a detail that we're kind of going to have to look at it a little more closely. Um, to be honest, we don't have it worked out at this point. Great. Uh, a few more questions. Um, while we're on that topic, talking about the, uh, the railing and the uh, planters, um, my personal feeling with this particular building uh, and the fact that it's a class one site and given its architectural provenance that a few railings as possible in front would be um, preferable. And I was at the site for an hour today, walking around, you know, looking at it from all angles across the street. And there's that center bit where the ramp is, which is kind of the center of your proposed project. And that's where one of the original signs were on the building. And it was kind of low because that's how things were back then. Everything was more kind of at or below eye level. 
back in the day. And you can see the holes in the wall from the old original sign, which are somewhat camouflaged by the tall uh, uh, vertical cacti that are there. So my question was, was there ever any discussion of maybe putting a low uh, privet hedge in that planter in front of the ramp to kind of uh, hide the angle of the ramp and to, uh, to uh, complement the horizontality of the building? Or does anyone know if that would be uh, unallowed by the ADA? Uh, you see what I mean? If, if right there where those people are sitting on that planter, if you put in a low hedge that came above the height of the rail, just above the height of the rail uh, that was cut, you know, trimmed at a straight line, it would hide that whole railing. And I'm not sure if ADA required railings or ramps to be visible from the sidewalk of the street, but I thought that would be a nice way to soften that particular area. And you could likewise do the same thing to the left where the cacti are in the plant as well, which not only would add more softness and visually balance that whole thing, but it would create somewhat of a noise buffer. The only problem, of course, is that it does start to hide some of that diamond facade, but uh, you can't have it all, right? <laughs> so I just wondered if there was any um, thought given to hedging there as opposed to railing in, in those two particular areas. I know, I think really everyone, you know, from Ken to another, actually the sound engineer that I brought out to the space recently, everyone has commented um, that the tall fence post cacti <laughs> seem to have to go. Um, in terms of a hedge, um, there's the ADA consideration and it, is the question to replace the railing with a hedge or to have the, the railing hidden by the hedge? To have it hidden. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think from our perspective, I mean, I think that for ABC purposes, we need the railing, the hedge may not be sufficient. So I think certainly hiding it, um, you know, as I've discussed with Ken and with George, you know, the, the plant matter that goes in there, I'm relatively, um, I'm open to anything just it's, yeah, I, I agree the fence post cactus isn't particularly attractive. Um, so the trailing rosemary that Ken mentioned, if it, it was going to be built up as something you know, even if it was, um, you know, at one point we had discussed, you know, putting Texas Ranger in there that would flower during the summer, uh, which would grow higher. Um, so I think all of those are options. George, from an aesthetic perspective, do you have a personal preference of hedge there that would hide the railing? Um, not really, other than, um, you know, it, as Ken mentioned in the staff report, you know, we are to look at the plantings that are in that existing planter um, it's defining part of our patio and I think if we're going to do that then um, it would sure be a more consistent look to continue with the same type of plantings um, in that planter that you're talking about in front of the ramp I um, mean it would just unify it um, all the way across and um, I have no problem with softening up the look um, along that street frontage um, with, with plantings. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think it would improve all projects um, a lot if we were to do that. Um, I think from, from the staff perspective, we would only suggest that whatever you choose to do with regard to a plant material there, that perhaps it would be best if it was consistent um, so that whatever you choose to put in front of the ADA ramp um, railing um, would probably be helpful if it was the same plant material that goes around um, the uh, planter area around the terrace just south of that. Um, exactly. I, I think that, um, again, the fence post cactus, I recall clearly when it was being proposed back in 2015, I strongly encouraged them not to put it in. And um, this isn't one of those where I like to say, I told you so, but I told you so. Um, I think it's better if uh, that uh, goes away and some other softer material that's lower and, and more green in its nature would be, would be nice. I don't care what it is. I just offered that as a suggestion and 
you want to work with the HSPB subcommittee on plant choices, um, I think that's a great idea. I think the only other thing to maybe point out, um, which might be relevant to this question, is if you look at the design that George has put together, the suggestion is to replace the ADA railing, which looks very institutional right now, with a de with the same decorative railing that would go around the um, you know, that would go around the patio. You know, so if we you know, if, if you agree that the that diamond pattern, which reflects the the fascia of the building as well as that wall, you know, if that's something that's amenable and we think that it adds to the to the aesthetic of the building, it's I think it's worth pointing out that it would also it would be part of the ADA ramp to and remove that, um, like I said, the sort of more institutional railing that's in there right now. Is the area that you're talking about um, uh, what we see on on this drawing? Yeah, so at the bottom where you've got the gate with the existing planter. So I think this was because this was put out relatively quickly. That was going to be the the cable railing that we had, but obviously we if we're going to do this diamond shaped railing, then we wouldn't have that. So it would just be the, the diamond railing. And I would suggest that it would go up. My understanding was that it was gonna go up the, um, go up the, the, the ADA ramp as well. So that it's all one cohesive you know, railing. I might suggest that we take a look at that in detail, perhaps with the subcommittee. My concern on that just from a staff level is that once you take that diamond pattern or whichever pattern uh, the board chooses and um, angle it, uh, you might run into some visual distractions. Hmm. Um, perhaps for simplicity reasons, you might want to keep the actual rail at the uh, ramp itself more simple. But okay. just a personal thought. Mr. Nelson. Yeah. So, uh... One more question for the applicant and then uh, a couple of comments. Uh, so I'll give my comment first. Uh, personally, I think that, uh, as I said earlier, railing should be very minimal and detract from the original architecture as little as possible. And I further believe that a diamond pattern that mimics the fascia up, up above would be inappropriate. Um, Typically in preservation, we, we like to take the approach that any addition should not try to create the impression that they are part of the original architectural elevation. So um, I know there are two schools of thought on that. So I hope you can understand and appreciate that because this is clearly uh, the only significant work in Palm Springs by uh, this firm, Provira and Lockman, and it is a very unusual and distinctive facade. And I would hate to have a modern edition that tried to look as if it was part of the original design intent. That's not meant as a criticism in any way, shape or form. It's just uh, where I'm coming from and projects that I've seen be restored throughout the state and the nation where they tend to take the approach that you don't uh, try to complement the original design, but rather kind of um, slightly distinguish from it. So you don't want it to be a huge contrast, but you want it to be uh, complementary in a subtle, uh, clean way without trying to look like it's part of the original detail. Um, so the very last question then for you is, why is a gate at the bottom of the ramp necessary? George, you want to take that one or do it since it's ABC, do you want me to take it? Um, so we, 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 we put the, we put the gate at the bottom of the ramp, we basically because it's an ABC requirement to, um, to close off the, the outdoor seating, um, we felt it was better to put it at the bottom of the ramp than at the top of the ramp, um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is it doesn't really work at the top of the ramp without losing a lot of patio area because I, I have to have a, a level landing at the top of a ramp. Um, and it's, um, you know, 
we already have the landing area at the bottom. Um, and since it, it becomes a ramp to nowhere anyways, um, we're, we decided to put it at the bottom. Um, if somebody, I mean, basically what we're, what we're trying to do with, with the whole project is have the main entrance be at, at the southernmost door. So um, there's already a second handicap ramp um, in front of uh, BevMo um, to the south. And so that would be, um, that would be the, the more sensible, accessible route in terms of how the project works overall. And then once, whether, whether you're in a wheelchair or, or, or actively mobile, you would be getting to this northern patio from inside of the building um, rather than from directly outside. Um, we do have the gate there so that um, if for some reason somebody did want to go up that way, it's possible to do. Um, it, it's also, it, it has an added effect of, of, of kind of mitigating that space so that, you know, people don't set up camp in there and just throw trash or whatever. It's, it's kind of, it, it's just a little cleaner to close it off. Um, uh, and then I, to, to speak to your comment, um, it's interesting because we've, we, we've, we've been going through a process together, Rob and, and Ken and ourselves. Um, and interestingly, you know, my point of departure was um, this very minimal, just linear railings and actually kind of, um, there, there are existing um, handrails on the steps that are literally just black posts and one black rail at the top, right? Um, and so, you know, we were thinking in those terms um, and then it morphed. And, and so, um, you know, we were looking at images of, of other um, ABC mandated railings around town. And, and um, we had images of um, the ones at El Patron, the ones at Lulu. Um, and um, one of the things that I've noticed and, and, and I've, I've done a lot of restaurants with, with outdoor spaces is um, unless it's a really solid thing, um, when, when you back up tables and chairs against a railing, what you see is not the railing, but the tables and chairs and the tablecloths. And, and, um, and, you know, you can, you can look at any of the restaurants along Palm, Palm Canyon and find that that's largely the case. And so, um, in our process over the last few days, going back and forth with Ken and Rob, um, you know, we, we kind of went from the linear railing to, okay, let's, let's look at different patterns. And we had the sort of diamond shape described with just bar stock, not solid. Um, and then at some point we, afterwards we, 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 we shaded it in and we thought, you know, that actually looks better. And so when you, when you have, Basically, what, what, what you would have is you would have the railing itself um, with the diamond motif. You would have the plants in front. And for the most part, the tables and chairs then disappear and you're, you're left with something that's a lot more architectural overall. Now, you know, we can, we can argue the merits and, you know, demerits of that. Um, but but that's that's kind of the process that led us to where we are tonight. Um, you know, um, uh, I'm I'm actually open-minded as far as what the color of the railing is. Um, I'm I'm even open-minded as to whether it's open or closed. Um, but just having having looked at a bunch of these over the last few days, it just and and it, it felt like. Um, you know, doing those solid pieces 
in this case actually made sense. Thank you. Mr. Lyon. I just want to chime in and, and reiterate what, what George had said. Uh, when we began the dialogue on this, my, um, my encouragement to them was to make these railings as minimal as possible. Um, and and we, you know, we can reach out to ABC and determine what is the most minimal kind of railing that they would um, consider um, a minimal requirement. Um, and just to speak briefly to Jade's comment, um, there are two schools of thought and there are, there is no right or wrong in terms of uh, whether you uh, replicate or differentiate. Uh, certainly with the 2015 project, uh, it was an excruciatingly detailed effort to replicate. And uh, the work that was done in 2015 is almost impossible to discern from that which was original from both 1958 and 1972. So I think both schools of thought um, can be argued uh, successfully in this case. Thank you. Member Dixon. And uh, when we were doing El Patron, we talked about having a uniform rail that would go down Palm Canyon. Did we ever go any farther with that? I mean, one of our concerns at that point was that more and more restaurants were putting up areas with fencing around them and we didn't want it hit and miss. Um, Member Dixon, no, that's not gone any further. It, it becomes quite a challenge uh, with respect to um, integrating everything on Palm Canyon with a particular railing type, uh, just simply because of the um, variety of architecture that we have there. Okay. I wanna just bring up for you briefly and show you the railing that you worked with the applicant on um, El Patron. So you okay. understand or are remembering what we show us. So, uh, this is the railing uh, at El Patron. If you remember, the proportions of this were designed to match those upper windows. Uh, so this was done as a very minimal sort of flat bar stock type of railing. See it. Is it on the screen? I'm sorry, did it not come up? I just, I don't know. Like that. Oh. I'm sorry. Bear That's okay. Me. Bear with me a moment. So I thought it had come up. Can you see my screen now? Yes. So you see the railings down here yeah. are what was designed uh, a few years ago with input from this board. And the proportions of these openings were consistent with the proportions of these windows. That's how this that's how this was generated. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I, I'm of the feeling <laughs> that less is more. So I like the original simple railing that was presented to us in the original report. Okay, so now that we can make that, um, have that discussion. Also, I think, Member Dixon, just a couple of moments, I think it was a good idea to talk about that. Member Kaiser. Do you wanna have that discussion with the subcommittee or should we do that? To me, that's a subcommittee issue. Um, also, in regard to a continuous railing style all the way down Palm Canyon is not gonna work because the buildings are not all the same. And it's more important that the railing style works with the building and whatever is approved for one area, if other railings would be put in on that building, that should be the standard. I don't think you can do it as a one size fits all because the architecture is so incredibly different all the way along, so. Well, that's what we discussed at one point. So I was curious as to whether we went further with it or not. Okay, fine. Okay, I would, um, I'd like to compliment um, 
you know, the, the owner and the architect and staff, um, this is the way it should work. The back and forth, you know, the explanation, the, uh, it creates an understanding. So I really, really appreciate um, your responsiveness as well, which I think has been really amazing, which doesn't always happen quite this way, as Mr. Lyon knows. So this was, uh, this, and this dialogue tonight even helps us, uh, you know, making these decisions uh, even further. I have some, um, a, a few comments and uh, questions, but I'd like to see if any other board members have any first. Um, okay, if not, then um, yeah. the establishment of a subcommittee on the HSBB to review uh, these various items. You know, we utilize this concept on the Oasis building and it really worked quite well. Oh, sorry, Mr. Nelson? I'd like to be on the subcommittee. But um, <laughs> I thought you might raise your hand. I also have um, a couple more questions and comments of staff whenever the timing is appropriate. Right, that's great. Go ahead. You can keep raising your you can keep raising your hand. That's just fine. Okay, thank <laughs> okay. you. Um, All right, but it really worked well, and um, I think that's the, I, I like the idea that we're going down that route. Um, in reference to the. I'd just like to make a comment here regarding the interior special effect lighting on the dance floor and the ceiling lighting to avoid glare and light distractions. Um, I think we learned something from the neighboring tenant down the way. And I, and I mean this in, uh, I don't mean this in any disparaging way at all, but as you recall that the, the lighting has been a concern uh, as it appears from the uh, street. So I just wanted the applicants to understand kind of where we're coming from with that as well, because it really does affect, I think, the um, original integrity uh, of the building. So I'm glad we're talking about that. Um, I have a question of staff in reference to the landscaping. Um, and this is just a question. Uh, will we lose the symmetry on the south end? And I understand totally that the cacti that's there um, it, from an operational standpoint um, is, is problematic. So it's, it's not that I'm in any way fighting that, but I'd just like to have uh, Mr. Land, do you have any comments? Do you think that symmetry will be broken or is that really that important? Well, um, I'm, I'm going to share my screen again with you and use that image to answer my question for you. Okay. Um, can you see this now? Yes. 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 Right. I would make the strong argument, as I mentioned, and I did it in 2015 and I'm doing it now, this fence post cactus was a mistake. And as you see the way that it's all kind of in a helter skelter yes. way now, it really lacks any visual sense of symmetry. Yeah. They, they just look, um, in my opinion, um, out of place. So I think that what this project has the opportunity to do is establish a new landscape palette for this facade uh, that perhaps in time can um, move into this area as well. But no, I'm not concerned about the landscaping um, being different in this area from what it is over here. Well, that's where I was actually going with a question because I was wondering if there's a way that I know we can't, uh, well, all we could do is request. But I think it would be timely to have that request for you know that landscaping um, on the south end to be um, redone uh, because it, it's also very distracting from the building. It almost takes over. It's really overpowering. So um, I, I think that that is something if we can ask as a separate issue. I know it is not part of what we're going to be 
uh, approving here, but I would appreciate some thought about that. I think it's something that you could offer forward as a recommendation to the building ownership. Yeah. Right. I think, uh, to saddle this particular tenant and applicant with relandscaping the southern portion of the front elevation, I think is perhaps unreasonable. Exactly. That's, a, that's exactly what I have in mind and I'd like to, to propose. And um, my other um, question is, uh, or comment is to strengthen um, the request to restore, um, or the uh, last thing to restore um, those improvements, like with the rails and railings and so forth, um, if they were to go out of business. And I know we have now, I believe, in the original designation, it exists that that if the tenant doesn't, then the owner will. So maybe there's no reason to add this caveat. Um, Mr. Lyon, do you have any thoughts on that? I'm gonna close my door. <laughs> we, have a, we have a dog, what is that called? Photobomb uh, Zoom session. <laughs> You have a new candidate member there for the HSPB, Dick. <laughs> he always makes his appearance at every meeting. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> would, you, would you be kind enough to repeat your question? Yes. Is it necessary to strengthen the request that in the unlikely event that the lessee were to go out of business, that those improvements that we're talking about tonight would be restored. Um, I believe that, if I'm under, if I remember correctly, that this uh, was in the original designation um, that in the event that were to happen, then it would fall back to the uh, owner of the property to make that restoration. Um, <clears throat> I. I don't off the top of my head remember if that was in. I can certainly do a quick review. I believe I have the resolution here in your packet. Uh, so if you give me just a moment, I'll do a quick read here and see if there was a condition of that nature. Okay. Um, so I'll give you a moment to do that. Uh, the only thing I'm seeing here, this is in your packet as well. It's on page four of the resolution. Um, it says, um, all future modifications of the existing structures as well as any new building shall require HSPB review. And uh, it's not required for portable detached or non habitable structures. Um, I don't see anything that is requiring uh, restoration of these kinds of details. So this would be something that you would be um, imposing on this particular approval. Well, we could, you know, have some further research um, about it and, um, and we can decide whether we want to put that in, you know, as part of the conditions or not. Um, We've seen other situations where you know, that can sometimes be an issue. Remember Nelson, did you have something you'd like to add? Yeah. Um, going back to the question of um, what is uh, required of the tenant as opposed to what is required of the owner, um, one of my questions was about new stairway entry rail for the doors, the Palm Canyon doors of the proposed project. I know they want to add two new doors in addition to the ones that are already there. So my question was, will there be stairway rail for all the doors or just the new doors they're proposing? And will they match the ones over at Babmo, which are quite nice and very clean and elegant and I think George spoke to them earlier about how he liked them and they're very clean and simple 
and they complement the building. Um, they don't detract from it. They seem very effective. So my question is, were you going to copy those railings? Is that your responsibility or the owner's? And if it's your responsibility, were you going to put them in front of every door or just some of them? I think I, that one I think I know the answer to. So the two new sets of doors, one set on the south, called the south patio and the other on the north patio, both of those doors are being put into place because the patios are being created to enclose the space per the ABC requirements. So those doors, other than on the one side having access you know, through the ADA ramp, those doors are gonna sit inside the enclosed space. So there won't be a need for, um, there won't be a need to add additional railings to access those doors. Um, in terms of, I, I don't know if, Ken, if we can scroll to the, um, you know, to the north a little bit, though the for the entry that we will have that is open to the public my suggestion is is that we will be doing railings that match bevmos there's no reason for us to do something different so we do we will need railings there to enter our space and that and that the new doors will actually be the main entrance to the space so there will be a, a railing there that matches bevmos Thank you. Um, obviously, being a bar, dance club, uh, lounge, my concern is, you know, for the patrons who may be stumbling out and need something to hang on to. So uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that that's okay. That's that's been my concern as well. Is you know the is the safer the better. Basically, at both the south and the north, um, the existing doors are, are going to end up being. Um, Actually, no, that's not true. So there, there's always going to be one pair of doors that has railings, just like in front of, of BevMo. And the other pair of doors will be into what was what will become patio space. So there'll be an ABC railing blocking the stairs. Um, um, but yes, it will be consistent as, as far as doors that you can get to from the stairs will have railings. and they'll probably all end up being the same along the whole frontage. Okay, Mr. Lyon. Um, for the board's clarification, George, do you know whether the gate that's proposed at the bottom of the ADA ramp will need to have an electric operator placed onto it with a button that someone can push to make it automatically open? I don't know. Um, My reason for asking that question is that it's one of those details that hopefully can be um, clarified uh, at the time that this project is further reviewed by the HSPB subcommittee. My concern on this is how to conceal additional metal conduit that may have to be brought out from the building in order to power up such a gate operator, and that could be a very visually detrimental detail that you want to think about carefully. Yeah, I, I, I think I'd want to research this a little bit, but my my initial thought is um, that would only be required if this ramp were the primary accessible route. Okay. Um, which I think we're going to try to argue that it's not. Um, Okay. Like I said, you know, I, I, I like, I'd like to get that on, on some higher authority as well. Thank you. Okay, um, I wanna, uh, Mr. Nelson. Um, do I have the floor? Great. Uh, so while we're on the topic of the ADA uh, and the ramp, one of my other questions had to do with uh, the access of the handicap from the parking lot to the front. I was there today and walked it, and it's a very long way <laughs> for somebody with a walker or a cane or even a wheelchair to go to get into your establishment. And I was wondering, because the parking lot 
uh, there's a door uh, to the back of your business right by the parking lot and the handicapped space. Uh, I was wondering if you had ever explored any way of having a handicapped entrance from the back rather than making them go all the way around, uh, which is quite a long way in, in my humble opinion. Um, so that, I guess, the question. <laughs> so the entrance to the back, I'm from a, from a business perspective, I'm open to having a handicap entrance in the back. The push and pull is going to be between exactly the issue that you've laid out of having someone walk around that distance or having to come around that distance um, and the potential noise issue. Um, the back side is sort of the, as you know, is the more sensitive side from a noise perspective. And so the concern um, is that as that door opens during business hours, that there might be noise that emanates from the back of the building and disrupts the um, the hotels that are immediately opposite us on, um, on Bilardo. So it's, it is a possibility, but it would, but effectively we would, I guess it's the, the planning commission that would weigh in on whether or not we're really allowed to use that door during business hours. I guess I'm open to it if somebody had a concern about getting to the front of the building. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to you know, be in a situation where as that door is opening and closing during business hours um, that we're disturbing neighbors. That being said, from you know, our existing business, you know, I know the volume of folks who are coming and utilizing the ADA entrance is relatively low. Um, and if that's something that the neighborhood can live with, it would work for me, um, but, it, but that's really where the concern lies. Great, thank you. I just have a couple more uh, observation questions, probably for staff, and I think the applicant should probably hear them. So I'm not sure if this is an HSPB purview issue, but I would like to think it is, since it's my understanding that the designation is for the site, which is the parcel, which would include the perimeter of the building, the parking lot, and so forth. So the question for staff is, can the perimeter wall along Ballarda be raised by a couple courses, so a couple more blocks to help buffer noise and possibly a hedge planted around the perimeter of that uh, wall uh, that surrounds the parking area. Uh, because standing there today, looking at it, seems like there's room for that. And it would uh, certainly um, lessen the impact that is felt by the hotels across the street, like the Del Marcos, mm. uh, the La Serena Villas, which of course have that uh, rooftop deck and the entry that looks out onto the parking area. So you can see right now, it looks like it's about four layers or four courses of brick. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering if there's a possibility, uh, clearly this would be an owner improvement uh, that the owner would be responsible for. But I was just thinking, you know, if that got raised uh, one or two layers, I don't think it would detract from the viewing of the building and it might actually uh, help uh, with noise reduction. Now those Texas Rangers actually look like they've grown in a bit, but um, you know, maybe a hedge uh, would be more in keeping depending on what happened with the front. So that was just an idea I had. Um, the other question for staff is that um, there are 10 original can lights along the top canopy of the building that appear to be missing. Uh, and they were the original historical can light that came out from the canopy. And today I noticed 10 of them were gone, including uh, some that would have been uh, in front of or around this project. And just wondering if those can lights were still in reserve somewhere or if the owner had any plan to replace them. Uh, just a moment, Jade, I'm gonna to try to get to the area I think you're asking about. Are these the lights you're talking about? Yes. 
I could ask the owner. I am not aware uh, of what's happened with them, but I can certainly ask the owner of the building if he knows what's happened to them. Great, thank you. My last comment is I'd just like to urge the subcommittee um, in working with the tenants um, to, that um, this is a repurposed buildings and, and I think it's very important that we do everything we can to understand their operational uh, needs and, and requirements um, as you have those uh, reviews. Um, because I think it's, um, it's particularly important for these buildings that we, uh, when you're talking about buildings that have been repurposed and that have historic significance. And it certainly is wonderful. And we look forward to having that entire building um, look full again. So um, I really, really appreciate uh, everybody's comments on, on this tonight. And are there any other comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, uh, may I have a motion, please? I move. <laughs> I, I move that we accept the report. I'll second. Okay. We have a first by um, a motion by Member Kaiser and a second by Mr. Nelson. <clears throat> any um, any opposed? Any further discussion? Mr. Lyon. Could you also identify in your motion uh, who the subcommittee would be? Yes. And we can do two or three, whatever you choose. I, I can't do more than three because we cannot have a quorum. Right. Um, I, I think actually- I'll volunteer. Uh, okay, so we've got, we've got two members who have volunteered and three volunteers. So we have, that? and that we already have Jade. Thank you. Then we have Linda, Ms. Dixon, and we have Ms. Hall. Thank you. So we've covered that. Okay, that's great. Um, so I, time to take a, a vote, all in favor. Mr. Chair, I think Mr. Nelson has a question. Um, so um, we made a motion and a second, but um, the uh, Staff recommendation was to grant the certificate of appropriateness with condition. So is this the time to stipulate the condition? And if so, what are they? Well, the conditions are those that are outlined in the staff report. Okay. Right. Anything else that we talked about tonight or, or not? I'm fine with uh, the questions that I had. I think they've been so, addressed and answered. For, for me, I think, you know, what I heard from uh, more than one board member here was uh, some uh, issue with the design of the railings. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that we somehow clarify with this motion for a certificate of appropriateness that uh, the main condition be uh, the design of the railing. And so uh, it's important to clarify uh, you know, what the board of the whole feel uh, that design should be, whether it should be the thin, um, thin uh, 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 black um, railing, like the, uh, like George talked about, that kind of complement the Bevermouth J railing, or that the horizontal steel cable, which staff uh, suggested maybe not be the most ideal solution or that the diamond uh, pattern thing, which uh, I don't agree with. So I think we need to clarify um, you know, what the majority of us feel is an appropriate design for the railing before we uh, take a vote. Yeah. Mr. Chair, the way this is written currently is on the condition number five, it says recommend a more minimal design for the ABC re required railings at the dining terrace. If you would like to uh, change any of those conditions, um, you know, you're welcome to do so. Hi, Mr. Kaiser. 
I would leave this up to the subcommittee so that they can be involved in this with further discussion with how the whole thing evolves. I actually like both and I can see the arguments both ways. But I yeah. do think that this is something that would be better handled within the subcommittee because we see how well it worked out at Patron and how good that looks and how good that will look for the rest of the building. And I think the subcommittee should work it out. Yeah, and I, I concur. I mean, I think this is the way to, to do it, these kinds of details. So if everyone is okay with that, we can yes. then proceed with the vote. Is that okay with you, Mr. Nelson? Okay, so, um, so we have a motion and we have a second. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries six oh, to zero. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I missed who the second was. Oh, the, the second was... Um, the motion was made by Dan Kaiser and the second was made by Jade Nelson. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So moving on to item five discussions, the 2021 symposium. And I just want to say thank you to the applicants on this particular project. You can uh, certainly uh, head on if you would like, or you may stay and continue to watch the meeting, but thank you for your uh, involvement tonight. It was much appreciated. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, in reference to the um, upcoming event, um, just a few items to cover. We've um, reset the date uh, for it's going live to April 24th. And the reason we did that as a subcommittee is the Modernism Week um, in April is the 11th to the 18th. And we figured we need to have at least um, a little breather um, before um, our event um, is, um, goes live. So the next item is um, presentation recordings are in process for the 23 individuals involved in the program. And um, I'm gonna ask if uh, uh, Mr. Lyon would please send out um, actually um, a list that will identify the programs, but also it will show you how we're keeping track um, of these recordings. Um, that's a lot of folks um, for it to be hurting. So um, anyway, it's coming a lot. We've already done several and um, our goal is we must finish this in February, uh, if at all possible. So. Um, the next item is um, Ken's uh, interfacing with the, our city IT department with different technical options uh, available to post the virtual event. And we'll know more about that um, in the next um, few days. Yes, I so, did get some feedback from Aaron Brown, the director of our IT department, but I don't have enough material here to uh, report substantively on it today. Exactly. So we, we can get back to you um, in a written communication with how that's going to uh, how that's going to play out. Um, in reference to the marketing of the event, um, the um, the Hubbles are actually creating a what they call a sizzle short video teaser to promote the event, which will be used for those uh, we are contacting. Um, to help us do the promotion, um, such as the organizations that which have always been so good about contributing and supporting this event um, with presenters and also helping us promote. Um, there will be an e-blast to the 2019 uh, attendees to save the date one month prior to the initial announcement uh, this is, uh, in 2019 was the last time we had a live event. Um, so that this has always been a major contributor to uh, our uh, events in filling the house. And then um, the idea is to, uh, then we'd have an, uh, follow that with initial announcement when we have the link. 
and about it going live. And then we would do a follow-up, a couple of follow-up e-blasts later as reminders. And uh, the subcommittee is divided up the 23 different sources we've identified. Um, so that's all in, let's say, as we would say in Illinois, high gear. Um, so that's my, that's my report. Um, Dan and um, Catherine, did I miss anything? Did you announce the uh, launch date? Uh, yeah. Chairman, did you announce uh, the uh, April, 20. April 24? Yes, yes. Did. yes. Okay. Yes, I did. Member Dixon. Is this going to be a live event? No, ma'am. This is it's virtual. Not. Why'd you okay. ask? <laughs> and, and how how many hours? How what is the time frame of all this? Is it okay? What we've done this year, which I think is people are going to really enjoy, uh, Linda, is that there are basically a couple of sessions, and um, they're each about two hours length. But there's also going to be a way that if one wanted to, I don't recommend this, of course, but if one had wanted to, they could pick and choose on the topics that they're interested in so that the viewer has a lot of flexibility. Our desire, of course, is that they will watch the whole thing. But in the real world, when it comes to virtual, um, we felt it's important to make this, to make this option. So it's, it's two hours, the entire? No, the, each, each of those uh, sessions would be, two, would be a couple of hours. And how many sessions are there? Two. Okay, so it's four hours. Yeah, and, right. And most of the presentations are uh, pretty much in the 20 uh, minute category. There's mm -hmm. just a few in the 30 and, and several in the 15. So they're not, you know, long, length, lengthy uh, presentations. One of the other advantages of doing this virtually, there are many, but um, when we're doing the recordings, we, we can do a lot of editing um, versus if it's live, it's live. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one really good thing. And um, I worked on the, on the hobbles with uh, a couple of other conferences that we've done for the Architectural Alliance and um, really getting this down to a science. So um, I'm really excited about, uh, I think you all will be too, and I'm anxious for you to get the program, the finalization of the program. Will IT be able to track how many viewers we get? That's one of our questions that's outstanding that we've given uh, that Mr. Uh, Lyon's gonna check on. Yeah, because, and I think there probably will be um, it's an important one for us it's to see. Thing. It'll be, yeah. It really is because, you know, with our live events, we've been very, very fortunate to have had sellout events. So it's really important for us to find out. And I'm sure that there must be a way well, to do Good job. Okay, so I will finish that. Uh, part of the discussion and 5B is the HSBB interview questions. So um, Mr. Lyons sent those out. I just threw out 15 only to stimulate your thought processes and to get your feedback as to um, uh, what you think about these suggestions and please um, add more. I know we received three from um, Linda today. And the idea, I just want to explain the idea behind this is um, these are only recommended, of course, um, to the city council that are going to be doing the interviews uh, because we just thought that it would be, they would be interested to know. Uh, we've all been through these interviews, some of us more than once. And so, um, what really makes up a good board member? You know, what's really important? Um, and for the, the applicant to consider as well. Um, sometimes we have applicants um, who have really not, do not understand um, really what the board's all about. 
and um, they've not really thought about the depth of the commitment um, or if this is the right fit. So that's why they, we designed these. They're purely recommendations um, to, to, the, to the council. Member Rosenau. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to really thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I was gonna actually bring this up in staff comments, sort of the status of our applicants, and I'm glad you actually put it on the agenda. Um, I've had various applicants actually ask me where they were in the queue and whatnot, and I'm, I keep telling them. And thank you very much. This is a very comprehensive list of questions. Um, one, one sort of aside that when I interviewed, whenever it was a year or two ago, one of the interviewees on council asked me about a specific site that for some reason I was not aware of, um, whether I wasn't aware of it or whether they were just reflecting it incorrectly or whatnot, but it sort of caught me off guard. So, for, you know, I, I like these more generalized questions about volunteer work, about organizations where you volunteered, where, you know, where, where were your members? I think those are all really, really valid points. And, um, and this is a very good extensive list to start with. Good, thank you. Member Kaiser, I believe you had your hand up. Jake, I made my own list. I haven't gone over your list, I will. And then I gave it to Ray to clean up the language. <laughs> and I need a lawyer to figure out what this says. So I'm gonna go back and rewrite them. And my question is, if these are not duplicates from your list, where should I send them? Um, Mr. Lyon, would you like those sent to me or would you like to receive them? Well, you have a list compiled and I would be comfortable if it's something that you want to capture from the other members sure. and compile if you want. All right, I'll send it to Dick and then Dick, you work it out with me. Okay, you. Dick? Yeah, that's good. Okay. I'm, I'm fine with that. All right, I'll rewrite this tomorrow. Okay. That's excellent. Member Huff. Um, I was thinking it might be uh, good to put a reference uh, in the questions in some way. Um, you know, if the applicant is familiar or has had a chance uh, to review or study or just, you know, look at or glance at the, uh, you know, Secretary of the Interior Standards uh, for Historic Properties. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to get a clue from uh, uh, an expert to tell me before my interview that it would be good to take a look at that. So I was informed. Um, uh, so not that we're putting people on the spot, uh, but just maybe some references, you know, has the applicant had the opportunity to review or glance at, or even if they're, you know, informed about uh, those standards that, uh, that, you know, guide us. I think that's very important uh, uh, question to somehow uh, ask. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very interesting idea. But, uh, Member Nelson, I'll come back to that. Yeah, um, so those are all great observations. I agree with everyone. Um, one thing I have missed on our board is not having the resident architect uh, like we had on our last board. And I think having a preservation architect mm -hmm. on the board was really a wonderful, meaningful thing. Now, of course, there are people in the community we can reach out to and consult with. But for example, when I was visiting the Robinson's building today, I thought, how great would it be if we were having a site visit here with a local preservation architect so that they could help us, you know, in figuring out the right things to ask and the approach to take with granting the certificate of appropriateness. So on that note, one of my uh, proposed questions that I think might be added uh, would be to a potential member, are you passionate about Palm Springs history? And if so, what part of the history are you passionate about? The architecture, the people, the place, the tourism, whatever. That way we're engaging what part that particular member has interest in. So that way, if other members have other interests, then we know we have a go-to person for architecture. And then we have another go-to person for people and so forth, so that there's some more balance to the HSPB as to which members know or appreciate which things that have to do with the history. Because some are certainly gonna be more architecture tuned 
And some are going to be more preservation tuned and others are going to be more people tuned. I happen to like all of them. <laughs> so I just thought that would be a helpful question. You know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's something that's been high on my mind uh, as well. And um, they have not closed the, not the, um, the, those who are interested in applying, but I'm sure it could be very soon. So if you have any recommendations to those in the community that are, have that background in architecture, I think the balance is super important. And there are so many times when those subtle details um, that an architect's going to pick up that maybe the rest of us would not pick it up. So um, it, it'd really be a nice balance to be able to do that. And I, I in, encourage uh, you and any of the other board members to think about any candidates. Uh, I've had a couple that um, I've been sort of having a discussion with as well that would fit that bill. So please, please um, proceed uh, on that. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Okay, and back to Member Huff's uh, suggestion about um, having the questions uh, available to the potential candidates in, in um, ahead of time. Uh, can I get a, a, an idea from the other members? Because uh, I think it's a very interesting point. Um, and, it, and it tends to narrow down. The other thing it does, it, I think it will tend to narrow down certain you know, people. I mean, you would be appalled um, sometimes. So um, I'd just like to you know, can we just take a rough idea as to how the rest of the board members feel about that being publicized in advance of their interview. And then we probably would have to ask counsel as well. Um, I would imagine, Mr. correct, Mr. Lyon? Yes. Yeah. So it, it would be a matter of a recommendation for him. So let me ask it this way. Does anybody have any objections of taking that course? What exactly are you proposing? Uh, Catherine, you want to repeat that again? Well, well, I was saying, I mean, oh, no, no, I understood what you were saying, oh. but I, I didn't understand what Dick was saying. Did you want to create this list of questions and give it out to all the applicants? Is that what you're saying? That's what, that's what Catherine had been, that's what she had suggested. And I just wanted to get the feeling of the rest of the board, you know, how you all feel about that and um, just see if there's any you know, any um, adverse things that we haven't thought about if we do that. Okay. Just, just a little bit, just a little bit of clarification. Um, I, I hadn't implied that every question would be uh, presented in advance. I That's was, right. what I thought. Yeah, not every question. I was just, I mean, when an applicant, um, you know, there, there's that questionnaire that they fill out when they apply that, that answers, you know, a lot of uh, the questions is, you know, have you read the city ordinance? Do you know the purpose of, of the, the, the mission and, and all that? Um, I just thought somewhere along the line of either during an inter in interview or in any uh, preparation or to just mention that it would be uh, valuable to review uh, the Secretary of Interior Standards, you know, uh, and I don't, I, that's just, a, it could be a question, you know, on the spot, but um, it might be nice to, um, when an interview is scheduled, to suggest that, along with, you know, the ordinance and, and other things that, that an applicant, you know, should read before they come for an interview. I don't know, Ken, Lyon, what, what, do, you, what do you think uh, along those lines? Well, I, I think having some, I mean, the questionnaire that they uh, fill out when they make their application has uh, some general questions. Um, you know, maybe part of what you might encourage uh, in your suggestion to the council is maybe one or two of your uh, proposed questions actually get incorporated into that uh, questionnaire application, mm -hmm. um, perhaps yeah. so that as you're suggesting, 
Member Huff, that um, an applicant comes in perhaps a bit better prepared. Better prepared, yeah. Yeah. Hey, Linda, I'm glad you asked that question because I was reading it totally different. So. <laughs> I didn't think that's what she meant. No, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, Mr. Nelson. Yeah, so um, I think I would agree uh, with Catherine that you definitely want to have question up front that they fill out the answers to in a questionnaire. But I think what might be helpful is if you add to your list, I think I saw 15 on there so far, maybe... Mm -hmm you know, make a list of 20, and then maybe from that 20, select the five or seven that they fill out on the questionnaire, and then pick another five that they'll be asked by their interviewees. And, you know, example of one of those could be, could you tell us two of the Secretary of Interior's uh, criteria <laughs> out of, you know, the seven, I believe there are, you know, you know, could you name two of them? like integrity obviously being one of them. So, you know, just cause it kind of puts them on the spot, but that's something they really should know if they're going to be appointed to the board. You see what I'm saying? But haven't they already filled out question uh, applications? I mean, were we tasked to redesign the applications and send out new applications? Yeah, yeah I, no. I, I think we have to be careful about- I agree. Trying to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just um, re rephrasing, maybe one of the questions could be, dear applicant, have you had the opportunity to review or are you informed about the document that the Secretary of Interior has uh, published that's on the standards for historic properties? Uh, are you familiar with that document or is that something you would need to study? That's an interesting way of framing it. Right, yeah. That's good, because we want to keep this simple. We don't want to get it complicated, right. you know. Of that's what we that's see. kind of what I mean. make, make a reference. Yeah. And, and Dick, aren't yes. these questions that you're going to give to the council members who are going to be doing the interviewing? Yes. And they have the option of asking any of those questions or none of those questions? Correct. Okay. Absolutely. No, this this is just ideas to, you know, our exactly. thoughts as a board, you know, what we think is important. For, mm -hmm. and so they can do one, two, three, five, none Correct. Um, that are on there. So it's like a smorgasbord that they, they, they choose from. Okay. So I think we have a, a consensus how we should move forward um, with that. Everybody comfortable? Mm -hmm. about that yes okay so i think we can end that discussion and move to board member comments Corey, your thoughts ideas this help <laughs> oh mr nelson yeah so bear with me here um this extra time makes up for the fact that we didn't have a meeting last month <laughs> so I have some comments for staff, and um, the first one being, uh, I know this is common knowledge, but I think it bears repeating here that the condition of the front of the Robinson building is a disgrace. Mm -hmm. It's a bad reflection not only on the city, but on the historic site preservation board. I get people telling me all the time, why does that building look so bad? Why are the homeless people there? Why is there human excrement on the wall? Why is there this and that? And I can't answer. I mean, it is the front door of the Architecture and Design Center. It is the, you know, it is the part of our downtown that you drive out of. It is, you know, so many things. And when people comment to me about it or complain about it, I, I don't know what to say. And I think that it's um, prudent for our board um, with city staff help to figure out how and if there is any way we can mitigate, um, you know, the conditions that are caused by, you know, homeless people and encampments and, and loiterers and so forth, because it's just absolutely, truly 
disgusting. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> it had to be sized, but I'm putting that out there. Um, on that uh, note related is the bus stop. It seems that uh, homeless people are linked to bus stops. And the one in front of this building is directly in front of the center of the proposed new project. And I think it's, it's, it's a bad thing, no matter how you slice it. Uh, past, present, or future, a bus stop there is never going to be an enhancement for that building. And I would love to see if there's some way the city could check to see if it could get moved. Is it something the city could initiate, that we could initiate, that the owner could initiate? What are the steps needed? I would think as a class one site and you know, something being in front of class one site that we should be able to have some uh, ability or say or part in the process of getting a bus stop moved. I think it would be to everyone benefit. Um, next thing is a list of things uh, for Ken to share with the planning commission, or I'm not sure, I don't, I didn't know where else to bring this up or how to say it, um, but there are three things I noticed that I thought uh, should be um, brought up. So just something I should vocalize now, or should I email them to Ken that the planning commission needs to address? because I'm not sure if they'll see them uh, when they visit the site or if they have time to visit the site before they uh, have their hearing. Okay. Are, they, are the questions that you want to bring up to the Planning Commission ones relative to the project that you just evaluated today or something entirely different? They are relevant. Relevant to the project that you heard today? <clears throat> um, if you would like to forward them to me when this gets ready to go to Planning Commission, it would be handled as a piece of public comment. Great. So you could either handle them to me or when that item goes to the Planning Commission, it will be a conditional use permit as well as the major or a minor architectural. And uh, as such, there will be the opportunity for public comment to be given. So you may either give those comments to me anytime you want prior to that hearing or when the hearing gets listed on the agendas for on the city website, uh, if you're uh, enrolled with e-notification, you'll know when that gets scheduled and you could submit your public comments then, either way, which is convenient for you. Wonderful, I will send them to you. Okay. And one last thing is uh, really just um, an observation or a comment that I thought would be kind of fun or cool if it could be um, implemented. In front of the project or in front of this building, the Robinson building, there are three city owned light posts or uh, light fixtures, like they have all up and down Palm Canyon Drive. And typically from those light posts, they hang banners. Uh, there are different banners like modernism we tech banners or the uh, students in the local school do um, Christmas designs and they hang them there or sometimes they have banners for uptown or downtown or whatever but wouldn't it be great if those three light posts had banners that talked about the history of the robinson building mm. one of them could be all about Pereira and luckman it could be like a little biography another one could be all about robinson and the fact that that whole block was the high-end shopping block you know department stores and fashion and banks and so forth and then the third banner could be uh, just about pump and preservation in general. So I thought that would be a cool idea and maybe those banners could be sponsored by the HSPB if we have it in our budget or by uh, one of the organizations. Uh, so um, that was just an idea. I thought it'd be a great way to bring attention to uh, you know the building and the Historic Site Preservation Board and all that. So. That concludes everything I need to say. That's great. Thanks, Jade. Um, these are very, very interesting um, ideas coming forth. I'm really glad to see it, uh, this happening. Uh, Member Hout, did you raise your hand? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, I, you know, I've received um, a few uh, questions uh, from um, colleagues in, in, in the area asking me about this issue. And so I, uh, thought I might bring it just as a casual comment. 
Um, you know, there are the neon painted art benches, you know, that have been placed around the city. And um, if they're placed um, in front of historic designated sites, mm -hmm. is that something that we should be taking a look at or reviewing? Um, I know it's temporary, um, but I, I was asked about uh, in front of uh, City Hall, you know, the, the neon painted art benches uh, that were placed right in front of City Hall. So, um, uh, how, uh, I don't know exactly how to respond. Okay, Catherine, interesting. Uh, that's top of my list on my board comments to talk about, to give you an update, which I think you'll be very pleased. Um, I think the whole board will be very pleased about. So um, I want to express my appreciation to Ann um, Shepard, the chair of the Public Arts Commission, for um, the responsiveness to the HSBB concerning installation at City Hall. Um, so uh, a list was prepared of the 10 properties that are owned by the city and that were sent to, to Ann uh, to be taken into consideration for future uh, installations. And then, um, so what happened is, um, Catherine and I, I mean, um, Ann and I then had a very cordial conversation about this issue. And uh, their Arts Commission is very sensitive about uh, what we have brought forth. So um, I think that um, there is, uh, we've been assured that those, particularly the um, trash receptacles and the benches, um, in front of City Hall, some of them have already been removed and the remaining ones will be removed as well. Um, so in my conversation uh, with Ann, um, I also made mention that uh, the same is true for those designated landmark class one and structure uh, of merit class two properties of private owners. So those that are designated would need to be a lot of sensitivity about um, what goes anywhere, you know, that, that can be construed as part of the building. Um, so um, I've been assured about this and um, it's, I think you're gonna see some action. Uh, so this will give you uh, now some information uh, when you're getting those requests, which I know I've received uh, numerous ones myself. And um, just as an FYI, so that everybody's kept in the loop here, um, there's an interest in the airport commission to add art installations. And um, so I reach out to Ken to confirm that the HSPB has curview of the exterior facade only because that's what's specified in the designation. So that the, um, and normally, you know, for city owned properties, the HSBB has purview of the interiors um, or, um, but the airport is an exception to the language in the designation only, only designates the exterior architecture. So, um, I thought this would be good for you to know in the event uh, to hear from the public and any thought in my discussions with Ann again, um, the uh, attention that they will give um, to any art installations there will not be on the exterior uh, going forward, but will be on the uh, interior. And even on the interior, what they are thinking of is, you know, that grassy area after you leave security, before you head to your gates, that that is most likely where there would be, you know, art installed. So I think we've made significant progress here um, in going forward in establishing the HSBB's concern. And I would say it was, it was met, I thought, very, very um, appropriately. So I wanted you to have that update um, in that regards. So any other discussion about that? 
Uh, I think that should clarify just about everything coming down the pike. Um, my last item is to, um, uh, we established the subcommittee to review the furnishings. So we're good on that. And I think that will be the end of my report for comments. So any other board comments? If not, I would like to move to staff comments. Mr. Lyon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, there's two things I just want to uh, bring up. Um, maybe three, maybe four, I don't know. Um, whenever you see something around the city, whether it's a historic site or some other, where there is damage, decay, lack of maintenance, the problems of the nature that uh, member Nelson brought up, remember always that there is a code enforcement um, link on the city website. Uh, so as the old cliche goes, if you see something, say something, um, use that uh, code enforcement uh, link on the city's website to help inform code enforcement when there is a problem out there. Um, I know from casual conversations I've had with Mr. Hall, who owns the uh, Robinson's building, that the maintenance problem out there as a result of uh, homeless people has been a nightmare for him. And I'm sure that he would love to do nothing more than have uh, somebody out there continuously cleaning. But it, um, it is a problem. Uh, it's a problem everywhere. And the, the best advice I can offer all of you, including the public, is if you see something, please use the code enforcement um, link on the city's website to report it so that code enforcement uh, has an opportunity to follow up with the property owner, or if it's in a, an area uh, such as a bus shelter, if there's graffiti or damage or vandalism, uh, they can communicate that on to Sunline. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to mention. Um, you know, there's no way that the city or even building owners can see everything. So that's an appreciated effort to do. The second thing, I want to just clarify a couple of um, Things, one of which was uh, the topic that um, Mr. Marshall brought up during public comment. As you know, the um, city's historic preservation ordinance has been amended a couple of times in the past two years. And uh, one of the amendments was that if it is a private submission or a private parcel, that it requires owner consent or that there's an owner representative who is uh, representing the owner in making that submission for a historic designation. So uh, if there is a third party who is interested in having a building nominated or an application submitted, we encourage them to work with the building owner to seek their consent to make that submission. And you will see in your applications, there is a letter from the owner stating, I hereby authorize whomever it is to submit this historic designation on my behalf. There's a second um, method that applications can be considered by the board in the way that the ordinance is written. And that is through your annual work program. If you recall uh, every year, I work with you to put together a list of usually about six sites that um, as time permits and staff resources become available, uh, that we forward those um, and advance them through the um, historic designation process. From time to time, if there is a third party person or someone out there in the public who sees something that they would really passionately feel is deserving of historic designation, those kinds of requests can come forward to the HSPB. And the HSPB can amend its annual work program. So uh, it makes it possible for a third party to bring in an application and the board has to consider it and determine whether it wants to make this part of its work plan and its priorities for what it's doing. But it is a possible way to doing it. Um, whenever we do work on a board-initiated 
uh, or city council initiated uh, designation, we always reach out to the building owner as soon as that application gets initiated. So they know the process has begun and they can either um, uh, communicate their support for the proposed designation or their opposition of it. So I just wanna make you aware of that. The second thing that I wanna make you or remind you of is there is the class three uh, list, which is identified as potentially eligible. That list, as you know, was originally created in 2015 to 2018 by a consultant who did a citywide survey and identified those sites which they felt had potential historic significance. They also identified areas around town where there was a collection of like resources that could potentially identify as a historic district. Those kinds of parcels are also in the class three list. Let's say somebody sees a building or becomes aware of a building that isn't on the list, but that may have some significant potential to be considered. Those can be brought into the class three list by means of the Department of Natural Resources, the DPR, I'm sorry, Department of Parks and Rec um, forms, what are called the DPR forms. And uh, that's identified in our ordinance as a means of bringing those kinds of uh, candidate sites into consideration. Uh, one of the buildings that is out there that came to our attention that was not on the list is the old Saks Fifth Avenue building by Welton Beckett on the corner of Palm Canyon and Ramon. And we uh, identified that as being potentially eligible and so that was shifted over to the class three list. So I just wanna remind the board, that's the mechanism that we have available to us and to you for sites to be considered for addition to the class three list, okay? Um, that concludes my um, comments. I wanna commend the board. I think your work today was um, thoughtful and uh, deliberate. And I just, uh, I wanna commend you on the good work that you did today, so thank you. Thank you. And I just like to add to that, um, the synergy um, um, within this board is really quite powerful and you can read it and uh, we're getting a lot of good work done. So uh, kudos to um, all of the rest of you. Mr. Nelson, did you have one more item? Yeah, just a follow up to what Ken was saying about class three and designation. So I think I know the answer, but my question is twofold. And the question is, can a private property owner who owns a house approach an HFP board member about writing a nomination for the house and then having it heard by the HFPB uh, for a recommendation to council? Uh, so that's the question. And then the additional question is, can they do, do that even if they're not on the class three list? So I think what you're asking is if a private citizen had a property and they wanted it to be nominated for consideration through the public hearing process of the HSPB and the city council for possible class one or class two designation, could a sitting member of the HSPB write that nomination? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Um, I think they can. I would like to get clarification from the city attorney. Okay. The question that uh, comes into my mind is whether that particular board member would need to recuse themselves when yeah. that item came to the public hearing before the agency. Yeah. I'll try to speak with the city attorney and get clarification on your question. Okay. So, um, and as far as not being on a class three list, um, you know, the if the property met enough of the Secretary of the Interior standards, uh, then there shouldn't be a problem with bringing forth a nomination, correct? Well, it isn't so much whether it would have any relevancy to the Secretary of the Interior standards, it would be whether or not it meets any of the criteria in the city's historic preservation ordinance that would qualify it as a class one or class two site. You should go. Okay, great. You've, you've uh, helped me, so, 
thank you for that clarification. And it's always been my understanding that uh, in the past, uh, HFPB members were encouraged to write nominations. So I'll be very interested to hear what you hear back from the city attorney. I will. Okay, that, does that uh, conclude uh, all other board comments? If so, it's time for adjournment. So the Historic Site Preservation Board will adjourn to its regularly scheduled meeting on Tuesday, March the 2nd, 2021 at 5.30 p.m. via Zoom. So stay well until then, and I will see you in one month. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you all. Bye, everybody.